Okay. Well, sorry, I left my tripod at home. I'm not sure. It might actually be better. Anyway, um, so this is the last lecture on lock. Uh, um, I would be worth spending a lot more time on lock, but oh well, if you do. Um, yeah, so the main uh, well, so the main things I want to talk about are and they kind of they have something in common as Locke himself points out. So one is conquest. Um, and uh, um, and the right of resistance to conquest. And then the other is the rights of resistance and rebellion against the government. Um, um, it would make sense actually to discuss along with these um, two other things. So, I mean, it will turn out that these are, these are basically times when uh, people are return to the state of nature and have rights that they would have in the state of nature. Um, with, you know, another thing that Locke talks about somewhat in this reading, and also especially in chapter 14 that I didn't assign, is times when parts of the government retain their rights of the state of nature, especially the executive. Um, so chapter 14 is that prerogative which means at least as Locke understands it, the right that the executive has to do things outside the law for the good of the people. This was kind of like the, you know, the thing I was saying before about how the executive has sort of emergency powers or, you know, like extra powers beyond what it says in the law. So, I mean, uh, Locke says, uh, that uh, as long as the executive is manifestly acting for the good of the people, no one's going to complain. <laughs> um, and they, you know, and they have that right under the law of nature to, to like protect the people. Um, as soon as it starts looking like they're using it for other ends, then uh, you know. He predicts there's going to be conflict and there should be conflict. That's kind of like a summary of what he says, but it's more complicated than that, especially because this was a this was a big issue in um, the English Constitution about what prerogatives were reserved by the crown, like what powers the king had, you know, that didn't require the authorization of Parliament. So, so I mean, Locke basically takes the position, well, in a sense, not. Right. I mean, it's whatever the law hasn't provided for in special cases or whatever. Um, but anyway, but the other thing is the other case I could have discussed also under this head is the so called federative power, um, which is kind of an optimistic name for it. It's the, it's the like foreign policy power in the Commonwealth. And Locke says, in principle, it's different from the legislative, legislative or the executive powers, but it's usually put in, the, he says, in the same person as the executive. And this, again, you know, I mean, I think his position is that the legislative can make rules for this, they can make laws for this, but a lot of times laws are not going to be the best way to go because there's no predicting what. Um, 
other commonwealths are going to do. Right? So as opposed to like subjects where you can kind of set up the whole framework and plan in advance what type of cases are going to come up. In foreign policy, you might have to, um, you know, kind of respond on the spot to unexpected developments. And that's why he says that usually the, whoever has the federative power, which is usually the executive, has a lot of freedom to do whatever seems best to them. Again, their right derives from the law of nature. Right, because the commonwealths, the different commonwealths are in a state of nature with respect to each other. And um, um, what was I going to say? Maybe that was it. Okay, so I, those are just, <laughs> this is kind of a paradox, but those are things I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> so, because uh, I'm going to spend the whole time talking about these two things. Um, but are there questions about either of those before I go on? Competitive power or prerogative to the executive? No? Okay. So now I'm going to talk about conquest. So, um, so what Locke says about conquest, um, a lot of it, I think, seems kind of like common sense to us. It's a thing. Um, at least like the common sense of, of right thinking people anyway. <laughs> um, uh, so it's important to realize to begin with when like uh, how little that was the case when Locke was writing. Right, like Locke starts off by saying, so this is chapter 16, section 180. Um, Well, that's actually not to start by anyway, it's in the middle of the chapter, but this I doubt not, but at first sight will seem a strange doctrine, it being so quite contrary to the practice of the world. There being nothing more familiar in speaking of the dominion of countries than to say such an one conquered it, as if conquest without any more ado conveyed a right of possession. Right? So the common sense of the people he's writing for is that uh, if one commonwealth wants some of the territory that belongs to another commonwealth. Uh, they can conquer it, and if they win, now it's theirs. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, what's definitely changed now is it's not so familiar to say that. Uh, like, what actually happens maybe has changed less, although I think it's also changed, but. I mean, it's certainly uh, not common sense anymore that, uh, oh yeah, if you want some territory for your country, you can just go conquer. <laughs> um, now, like that change, I guess, um, it happened more like in the 20th century than the 17th century. So I don't know whether Locke deserves any credit for it. But maybe he does. Um, I mean, it's like, actually, I was talking to Dexter about this a little bit after class last time. But Locke is interesting because, like, I mean, like how much personal responsibility he bears either way is hard to say. But he could kind of be blamed for getting European colonialism going or like justifying it. I mean, I think we saw. And you see in this reading too some of the things he's saying that can be used that way and that he intended for that purpose, I think. But on the other hand, you know, he could be credited for getting started the ideas that would basically delegitimize colonialism in general, um, which we also see in this reading. Um, in any case, uh, you know, however that may be. So, yeah, basically, Locke just takes down the whole entire idea of conquest as a means of attaining territory. Um, so, I mean, he starts, this is the easiest part. He starts by talking about conquest by the unjust use of force. Um, 
right? This is chapter 16, section 176 on page 91. Um, that the aggressor who puts himself into the state of war with another and unjustly invades another man's right can, by such an unjust war, never come to have a right over the conquered, will be easily agreed by all men who will not think that robbers and, robbers and pirates have a right of empire over whomsoever they have force enough to master. Um, so actually, I mean, you might think, well, hold on a second, Hobbes doesn't agree with that. But the truth is Hobbes does agree with that. He just kind of agrees with it vacuously, right? That is, he, he doesn't think that invasion of anyone's rights is in the state of nature is unjust. <laughs> so, um, so the situation never comes up for him. It's always just. Um, uh, so, I mean, so as usual, Locke probably has a good argument against some people. In this case, I don't think it's Delmer we'd be talking about, but maybe I'm not sure who exactly. But really, when it comes to Hobbes, there's only that one basic disagreement about whether there are limits on rights in the state of nature. Um, but in any case, from Locke's point of view, I mean, I guess the one thing that Hobbes wouldn't agree to in what I just read is the thing about the aggressor. That the aggressor who puts himself into the state of war with another and unjustly invades another man's right. So, like, according to Hobbes, there is no aggressor because there's always a state of war in the state of nature. But no one started the war. Um, so, so therefore, it, like it never matters who did what first, according to Hobbes, that's irrelevant. According to Locke, the state of nature is fundamentally a state of peace under the law of nature. And whoever breaks it is the aggressor and they're unjust. So um, um, in principle, at least, I mean, there's complications to this, but at least in principle, in any war, there's like one person who's the aggressor and their war is unjust and the other person, the other side is defending and their war is just. Um, and if you look at it that way, then just without going any farther, Locke has already knocked out most cases of conquest, right? Because most cases of conquest are like war that's started by the conqueror for the whole purpose of acquiring new territory. Right, so like the whole history of the expansion of all those empires, you know, like Assyrians, the Persians, the Romans, Mongols, Incas, whatever, right? Like that, all of that is illegitimate by this standard. Um, um, on the other hand, I think uh, Locke doesn't want to stop here because, um, well, I think for two reasons. Well, maybe, I mean, aside from the fact that he doesn't think he has to stop here, he has more to say. I think that the reason he thinks it's important not to stop with that is, first of all, that it's pretty easy to invent pretext to claim that your war is just. Um, right, that's why I, I started off by saying that like, definitely what we say has changed a lot since the 17th century. What we do is maybe has changed less, right? Because, uh, you know, like what we do is if we want to start a war, we make sure we have a pretext to say that it's just. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't, uh, when he says um, that, uh, like, if a uh, commonwealth's not like uh, making use of their land, that that's a pretext for him to, like, uh, take over their land so that he can be more productive with it or whatever? That's kind of like the idea that's going through. Right, so I mean that's a case. Yeah, that was I was hoping to talk more about territory. I guess thought I might talk more about it today, but I really, you know, I'll I'll say something about it. You know, like 
So his only explanation for how a commonwealth comes to be identified with a place. Like, I mean, a commonwealth, I think Hobbes doesn't even explain this at all. Right? Like a commonwealth, uh, according to Hobbes or Locke, is basically a bunch of people who made a compact with each other. Like, why does it matter where they are? <laughs> you know, so Locke has some explanation. He says, well, the people who make the compact have land already when they make the compact and they bring their land with them. So their land is the land that they're, you know, actually using. Now, assuming money has already been introduced, they could be using a lot of land. But presumably there's also going to be land they're not using around here. Um, I mean, he also doesn't really explain what's so special about land. I mean, this is important both because, I mean, so the land is going to have to be like, the inheritance of land is Locke's full explanation for how the commonwealth can last more than one generation. Okay, he says that, you know, the new generation that wasn't that is growing up now that wasn't a party to the compact, what, like what reason do they have to obey the laws of the commonwealth? And he says, well, none really, they're free. But if they want to stay on this land and inherit this land, they're going to have to accept it. So uh, why is that? Like, why does the land keep its, so to speak, allegiance to the Commonwealth, even though the original proprietor is, is gone? <laughs> I mean, presumably that's not true for most, for like movable possessions. Right, like if you know, like if my father left me a pencil and now I want to move to France, I don't I, like England can't say, well, you're still holding our pencil. <laughs> so I mean, he doesn't really explain. I think you can think of explanation. I mean, it definitely is a very special type of possession, right? But anyway, so for whatever reason, you know the. the this this land becomes attached, like permanently attached to the commonwealth. But then the question is, and so much so that now someone else who's freely existing on this land, as long as they're there, are subject to the laws of the commonwealth, even though they came from somewhere else and are intending to go back. Um, so, but what about this land in between? And, you know, like that's important because as I think I mentioned before, the highway, right? Remember why I didn't want to erase the highway last time because I kept thinking I would go back to it. The, like the, his example is someone walking out freely on the public highway in England is subject to the laws of England. But the public highway, I mean, unless we think that this was made on land kind of donated by the original, people who made the commonwealth, which I guess is possible. The common highway is like, it doesn't seem like it was anyone's property ever. But somehow it's got included in the commonwealth. And so, um, so the question is like, even accepting this story about the property, the real property that people bring in, how does the commonwealth get this continuous property? that includes land that's not being worked and public land and whatever. And, you know, why is it that in Europe, all the land is claimed by one commonwealth or another? So Locke does have an explanation for that, I think. Um, he says that it's actually by an agreement between the commonwealth, perhaps a tacit agreement. Right, that they've they've agreed to to divide off the land between them. Um, and so when he talks about the waste land that you can move into, he says, "Well, but suppose there's some place where people are living, and they have no previous league with you or anyone else where you live, and they have all this waste land." then you can move in. <laughs> so um, 
So, I mean, like what that means, I guess, so if this is America over here and, you know, the natives have this land that they're using, but I mean, we know that at least in, so this isn't going to work so well for like South America or Central America, but we know like in North America, um, these people aren't using very much land at all. Right? I mean, they're mostly hunter gatherers. I mean, they, 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 they do have some agriculture too. You know, teaching the children about corn or whatever. <laughs> so, um, so they were growing corn, right? And, and a bunch of other crops, but they weren't using very much land at all. So, you know, so presumably Locke's view is, well, of course, you can't take this land, that's there. But all the other land that they're not using, or not using to its capacity, right? Not uh, cultivating, not putting, not mixing their labor with, you can take. That seems to be the position, and that would like justify, you know, uh, the. Um, that's not my part. All right, um, that yeah, that would justify, you know, like the, the colony of Carolina or whatever, at least as Locke envisions it working. In real life, obviously, people come in, and, you know, the natives. Say, hey, look at our corn that we're growing, you know, and they say, oh, that looks nice. Uh, by the way, we want all your land. <laughs> right? And I think that's kind of predictable, right? Like, it can't be that, you know, someone is going to like set up a commonwealth, except on these little pieces. And these little pieces are going to be just fine. <laughs> so it's, you know, I mean, uh, even if you accept the, the principle behind it, it's obviously a kind of dangerous doctrine, right? You know, uh, but, um, and it also, you know, depends on this presumption that Hobbes and Locke share, but as we'll see, Rousseau definitely does not share that um, this way of life is obviously better. This is obviously a better way of using land. And the way the so called savages use. Um, right? Because otherwise, if, like, if you think that this use of land, where there's a few little pieces that you're growing some stuff on, and then there's a big forest, is actually the best way to use land, or, or an, even an equally valid way to use land, then you know, you're going to want the well, I mean, it's not clear where the where the enforcement tools would come from. But like anyway, like you would want to say, well, that should be protected. <laughs> that land should be protected. Right. So it's like it's based on the idea that this land is based, is not being used properly. Anyway. Yeah, I think that's all I can say about that. It's like I said, it's a little bit mysterious because I don't really understand, and Locke doesn't explain very well the whole way that commonwealths get any territory. Right? I mean, because like you might think that the people are the commonwealth, and you know, this land is my property, and as long as it's my property and I'm a member of the commonwealth, the commonwealth might have certain rights to it my representative or whatever to tax it or something but like as soon as i give it or sell it to someone else who's not a member of the commonwealth well the commonwealth has nothing to do with it that's what you might think uh, yeah that wouldn't be very practical <laughs> anyway did, did i did i did i sort of answer your question or i mean you sort of question. <laughs> okay um I mean, you know, so that is relevant because what I'm going to go on to talk about is um, uh, well, let me finish what I was saying first. So, so why Locke doesn't want to? So, I mean, so by the way, when you, so 
But when you say that, like, for these people to move into this unused land, is it just war? Well, I don't think, um, I mean, so from Locke's point of view, this land isn't anyone's property. So if I move into it and start cultivating it, now it's my problem. So then if these people attack me, they're the aggressor. So moving into here isn't the war per se. Even though, you know, again, you might think, well, are these people really gonna just sit and watch that happen? <laughs> but but Locke does seem to have thought that, you know, like when he talks about Carolina. And it was true at the beginning in Carolina, like the neighboring, I mean, I guess like maybe neither Locke nor the native uh, indigenous people at the time understood that the settlers were gonna use up all the land. <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe they just, they thought it was gonna stay small. And I don't know. Anyway, yeah, so that, so, so there isn't a just war to take this Land because it's, it's that is this isn't conflict. It's only war. There is no conflict. Um, if if these people attack and we fight back, now according to law, we're in the state of a just war. Right, our side is just. But then he's going to say, so does that give us give us any right over these people's territory? That's the question we're about to discuss. But okay. Um, so, right, so anyway, so Locke doesn't want to stop, stop with talking about a just, the victor in a just, in an unjust war, because that is, I mean, every war is both an unjust and a just war, right? It's unjust on one side and just on the other, but a lot of times he talks about it this way, like, the un, anyway, the unjust victor, he doesn't want to stop with thinking about that, talking about that, because number one, it is very easy to, to invent explanations for why the other side is the aggressor and you're, I mean, especially because and this is always important to remember that like the state of nature gives you the right to defend people against third parties, right? So it's like, if C is attacking B, then it would be a just war for A to attack C in order to defend B even if C's not attacking A. So, I mean, you know, this this makes sense, right? And the whole, the Locke's whole picture of the law of nature, of the state of nature only works because of this, where we have individuals, right? That if a bunch of, if, if, if everyone around sees someone doing injustice to you, we're all gonna come in and punish them. Right, um, but on the other hand, obviously this is right with opportunities for, you know, claiming that C plans to perpetrate genocide against B and we're gonna come in and stop them or whatever, right? So so that's one reason why he wants to make clear that even the victor in a just war has very limited rights. And the other reason, well, maybe it's kind of the same reason. In the state of nature, there's no umperage, as he says, right? Like there's no impartial judge to appeal to. So like, you know, if I say this is a just, if A says this is a just war because of blah, 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 and they have a big argument, and C says no, it's an unjust war, well, there's no way to settle that question except by having a war. <laughs> so, um, right. So, um, so therefore, Locke wants to show that even winning a just war conveys basically none of the rights that you might expect, almost none. So, I mean, it's not promising for him to show that because Locke does concede, as we've already seen, that the aggressor forfeits all their rights, um, all, their, all their property, which as usual includes not just their estate, but their life and liberty also. Most, most importantly, their life and liberty. So, um, so the, you know, if the just side wins, um, 
they get absolute dominion over uh, aggression. You know, they can impose whatever penalty seems right to them, uh, up to and including death. And um, that, you know, as we know, is the condition for enslaving people. Right? If you have the right to kill them, you can always say, well, I'm not going to kill you, but you have to work. <laughs> so, um, um, so it seems like the just combatant is getting a lot of power over the aggressor when they win. Now, um, Locke says two things about this. First of all, he says, this is despotical dominion. It's the dominion of a master over slaves. It's not political dominion. Political, right, or civil dominion, as you might call it, which again, student class and Paulus are the same, right? So political dominion can only be by consent. So, okay, you might say, well, that's worse, right? I mean, that's more power, not less. But, it turns out that um, that paradoxically, this kind of absolute power over the aggressor um, is uh, much less than political power. And why is that? So this is how Locke explains it in uh, chapter 16, section 178. Um, page 93. He has an absolute power over the lives of those who by an unjust war have forfeited them, but not over the lives or fortunes of those who engaged not in the war, nor, nor over the possessions even of those who were actually engaged. Right? So what he's saying is that the um, Victor in uh, in a just war, that is the just side if they win, has power to enslave the, the combatants, the people who are actually fighting against them. But not any, they have no power over anyone else. And they have no power to take the possessions of the combatants. And so uh, like Locke, First of all, assumes that the um, all women are among the non-combatants. Yeah, I mean, um, even assuming women don't actually fight, that's a little bit questionable, I guess, in the sense that there's plenty of other ways of, like, as he says, the assisting, con concurring, uh, consenting to the unjust force besides actually, like you know, being in the battle. Um, but at least, I mean, he does have, I think, he has an argument that at least there's no presumption that they concur. Um, this is section 179, so it's right after what I was just reading. I shouldn't have closed the book. Um, The conqueror gets no power, but only over those who have actually assisted, concurred, or consented to that unjust force that is used against him. For the people having given to their governors no power to do an unjust thing, such as is to make an unjust war, for they never had such a power in themselves, they ought not to be charged as guilty of the violence and injustice that is committed in an unjust war any farther than they actually abet it. Right, so what he's saying is like you can't say, well, um, this uh, you know government that carried out the unjust war against me was governing by the consent of the people. So the people obviously consented to this unjust war. So they're all responsible. He says, well, but the people didn't consent to having their rulers do injustice on their behalf. How do we know they didn't? Well, this, this I was talking about last time or the time before, like they can't, <laughs> right? Like I can't give someone the power to do injustice on my behalf because as Locke says, I don't have the power to do injustice. 
right? Like I don't have the right to do that. So I can't like make someone else my agent to do it. So, um, so however much it seems like the people were not upset with this or whatever, you know, unless they explicitly said, I like this war and I consent and I'm gonna assist in this. Um, uh, they, you know, um, they can't be held responsible. Um, so, I mean, so, so far I'm talking about like adult non-combatants, which, you know, is a tricky issue. But um, as far as the children goes, and then like, let alone obviously the, the yet unborn descendants of the combatants, right? So like, there's no way they can be responsible for this. So their lock is on stronger ground. Um, and um, it's, uh, um, So, so like law, so like first of all, Locke is, I, you know, I think um, has an easy case to say. So obviously, the victor, even in a just war, gets no political dominion over children and descendants of the people who are fighting. Um, so, I mean. Uh, that pretty much already takes away most of the purpose of conquest, right? Like you're, you know, you're not actually, at least as far as conquering people goes, you're conquering a particular group of people now, but you're not conquering like a people, right? You're not conquering like someone and their descendants. Um, so, I mean, I guess uh, the other issue, however, is, well, maybe you don't care about the people, but you want the territory. So, um, so Locke does admit that the victor, the just victor, has a right to reparations. Um, right, as we saw before a long time ago, uh, in a state of nature, and this, right, because this was a war, like, even if there was a, some kind of league, right, so, I don't know if I've said this explicitly, right? The, the, according to Hobbes, like agreements between different commonwealths are not worth very much, right? Because they're agreements made between people in the state of nature. According to which, according to him, you, there's no uh, um, requirement to fulfill your part of. Um, according to Locke, you can make binding agreements in the state of nature. Now, like exactly how that works is a little unclear, right? I mean, if you go back to the question of what is what is actually restraining their will, you know, like so, if there's in the in the individual or original state of nature, we understand this. Like here, are these two people they made an agreement between each other, not an agreement to form a commonwealth, but just some limited agreement, right? Like if you give me acorns today, I'll give you plums tomorrow, or whatever. Right, and then so one of them comes through with their part, and the other one refuses. So this one is going to talk to everyone around all the other people and say, "Hey, this guy is being unjust. Will you help me punish him?" Um, so at least in the treatise, as opposed to in the essay, remember it seems like that is how the, the law of nature is supposed to be enforced. Um, but, you know, uh, in the case of Commonwealth, this may not work very well because, like, if there's an agreement between these two commonwealths, <laughs> you know, like, uh, um, if you don't disturb my forest, I won't take your fish or something, right? And one side comes through and the other doesn't. So this side, you know, this one is huge. These people may not be able to find 
you know, enough rate. Like this, again, this is a version of the same question I asked about Hobbes, you know, the equality in the state of nature, that even the weakest um, is strong enough to kill the strongest, do you, arguably holds in the individual state of nature, but it's not clear that it holds in this state of nature, which is common. Especially if this commonwealth has nuclear weapons, but of course, uh, Locke doesn't know about that. That's not so about that. Anyway, <laughs> um, so, uh, um, but in any case, so it, even if there were some kind of binding agreement between the commonwealth before the war, that entering into a state of war returns you, you know, it's like, um, well, That's not right. Entering into a state of war doesn't necessarily cancel all your other agreements. Hmm. Well, but in any case, if there's a state of war, you're definitely in the state of nature, whether or not there's any other agreement. All right, so that maybe that whole big question was irrelevant. Um, so in a state of nature, there's two purposes, two permissible purposes of punishment, according to law. Reparation and restraint is what he calls it. So restraint is um, the um, use of force for deterrence, basically. Right? It's to um, deter the um, party who has actually done injustice from doing it again, and to, by example, deter others from doing it. So it's so the um, so the amount of uh, punishment you're allowed to impose is exactly enough to make it, as he puts it, a bad bargain to do the like in the future, right? So it has to be enough that it outweighs whatever they might have gained from. Unjust act. Um, and, and that is a right of everyone, right? Like anyone who sees in a state of nature, who sees anyone violating anyone's right, has the right to, to punish for the purpose of restraint. The other purpose of punishment, so called, is reparation, which means that the party who's been damaged by injustice has a right to. Um, to like get their damages repaid by the person who violated their rights. Um, and that's a right only in the victim, although other people can do it on their behalf, right? But if they do it on the behalf, they have to actually give the reparations to the victim. Of course, they can't keep it for themselves. <laughs> so, um, so those are the two permissible purposes for punishment. Um, and um, I think it wasn't so clear when he first discussed this in chapter two, but I think it becomes clear when he discusses it again in chapter 16 that, um, you know, restraint, So the, first of all, that these two are in principle completely different, right? They're like for different reasons, basically. And it's really, first of all, this is the only one that strictly speaking is punishment. And second of all, and this I think is what really only becomes clear in chapter 16, Locke thinks that it's really only this one that justifies the use of force. Um, this is in section Page 95. It is the damage sustained. Um, no, here we go. It is the brutal force 
And you know, by brutal, he means literally like like an animal, like a brute beast. You know? It is the brutal force the aggressor has used that gives his adversary a right to take away his life and destroy him if he pleases as a noxious creature. But it is damage sustained that alone gives him title to another man's good. For though I may kill a thief that sets on me in the highway, yet I may not, which seems less, take away his money and let him go. This would be robbery on my side. Um, so just having been damaged in itself is not a just cause of war. The damage must have been caused by force or it must be maintained by force, right? So like in the case of, um, I guess, so he's kind of threat of force under force, right? As I mean, as he as he's going to explain when we get to the other stuff about resistance and so forth, it's no good to have this right only after the thief has killed you. You have to have it before they've actually killed you, right? So if someone is threatening force or using force on you for whatever reason, basically, you have a right to punish them and in such a way as to deter them and even to kill them if that's necessary. Um, but uh, on the other hand, suppose they got your goods by fraud, not by force. Um, so um, Locke says that by itself doesn't give you a right to do anything. Um, well, of course, it gives you a right to go take your stuff back if they took it. And if they maintain it by force, then, right? So it's like, it's not maybe as much of a limit as, as it seems because, right? So like if, someone's, like if someone picks my pocket and takes my stuff peacefully without threatening me with force, then if I say, hey, give me back, that's mine, and they try to retain it by force, then I have a, a right to attack them. So, um, so it's not, so I'm focusing on this not so much because it puts a limitation, like a strong limitation on just causes for war, but because um, it shows like how, how distinct these principles are, in in, like according to law. Um, so that is just as having been damaged in itself is not a just cause of war. On the other hand, just the act of aggression by itself gives me no title to any possessions. All I can do is like um, um, resist the attack. Now you might say, well, Wait, hold on a second. Haven't didn't you say before that they forfeited all their property, even life and liberty? The aggressor, right? So how can the aggressor have retained any possessions? Because they, they didn't even retain their own life and liberty. So the answer is, it's true. The aggressor doesn't retain any title to their possessions. That is, the combatants don't retain any title to their possess possessions. They're slaves. They don't own anything. But um, that doesn't mean that the title to the possessions is transferred to the victim. It just means that the aggressor doesn't own them. How would the victim get a right? And the answer is that except for the purpose of reparation, the victim doesn't get any right. So what happens to them? Well, the aggressor having, that is the combatants having forfeited their life, it's as if they're dead. So who does the property go to? It goes to their heirs. That is, assuming their heirs are innocent, right? Um, it goes to their next innocent heirs, let's say the next non-combatant heirs. Um, so, 
So that means that this by itself doesn't give any title to the possessions of the combatant. Right at the that is at the time they say, okay, my life is forfeit. Make me a slave if you want. They're at the same time they're transferring the title of all their possessions to their heirs. <laughs> so instead, like only reparation gives the victor, even in a just war, any title to the possession. Um, so first of all, Locke says, well, you know. Um, the, if the combatants' wives have title, to, you know, have uh, um, partial title to their property, then the aggressors don't get any, I mean, the victors don't get any title to that part. Um, because um, uh, the reparation has to be paid out of the property that was the combatants' property. I, you know, you might think that you could take this farther and say, now it's the children who are innocent, so there's no way to collect that. <laughs> but he doesn't say that. Somehow it's still connected with them enough that they have to take reparations to be taken out of them. Um, I mean, I guess, well, I mean, it's like this, and well, I'm not sure how Locke explains this either, but, you know, like, if, if there's like a court judgment against me that I have to pay someone damages and I die and I pass my property on, um, my, my inheritors still have to pay the damage. So it's like that, I guess, yeah. Is it maybe in like the distinction that it's like the, the, the um, victors are taking it away from like the sovereign, not the, the individual people? Well, no, because we're assuming, so, so Locke assumes when he talks about this, he doesn't really talk about the case where one commonwealth has like conquered a certain amount, a certain part of another commonwealth. He's mostly talking about the case where one commonwealth has completely conquered another. Right? So he, he always says so like their 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 existing commonwealth is dissolved. Right? So there is like the legislative power is, is not there anymore. So there is no more commonwealth. Um, so, no, he really is talking about taking away from individuals. Um, you know, like what he would say about this case. But, um, uh, so, anyway, so, but there's further limits. So, first of all, like whatever property belongs to adult non combatants is not subject to. Second of all, the, the combatants' minor children or unborn children have a right to be like sustained out of their possessions. So, um, so there's like competing rights to this property. And Locke says that the children's right is, is prior. Yeah. I was just wondering that because uh, like after the victor, uh, like the uh, Commonwealth dissolved. Yeah. So in that case, does the Commonwealth like out of state of war with each individual person in that other Commonwealth? Or? So okay. So yeah, there's there's some there's some things that Locke leaves a little bit. Right. So this is what happens. So like B attacked A first. So B was the aggressor. Then A comes in and destroys. B society, like conquers all of B. Now, uh, um, B, the former territory of B basically contains a bunch of people in the state of nature. So Locke says they're just as free as anyone else in the state of nature. They, they have a right to make a new commonwealth however they want, or not. Um, and A can't interfere. Um, now, I mean, it would be different if A got title to this territory. So that's why Locke, like Locke wants to settle that first. That 
this is still A, and this is this is not A. This this was B, now it's like nothing. So like so what should really happen? I mean, you know, so in like in real life, should does this mean that A as soon as they quote unquote win have to leave immediately? And then they just leave the state of anarchy here, or these people just like regroup and attack them again, or well, I mean, you know, this is because like what actually happens after one country conquers another, even if they're not intending to stay, is that there's a military occupation. And like that's a pretty dangerous state, right? And Locke doesn't talk about that at all. What I mean, presumably he will have to allow some right to do that. He's not gonna say that A has to go back and leave chaos on its borders. But once you allow that, then it's a lot trickier. Like how long can it last? And, you know, what do you are you allowed to make laws and how are you allowed to enforce them? And, but anyway, so he doesn't talk about that. So like his view is basically just, yeah, A leaves, and then these people can decide what to do. That's what should happen. Does that answer, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, okay, but I, I still didn't get to, um, to talking about, so, um, so this does give some rights to, to the possessions of the, um, of the vanquished, right, to the victor. Um, I mean, it can be pretty limited. Uh, as I was starting to say right before I asked the question, like, basically, they have to leave enough to support the children of the combatants. So uh, they can't just, even if there is huge damages against them, they can't just take everything. Um, but then Locke's main argument is, um, this is section, chapter 16, section 184, page 96. Um, the damages of war can scarce amount to the value of any considerable tract of land in any part of the world where all the land is possessed and none lies waste. That last qualification, again, may introduce all kinds of dangerous possibilities, right? But he's, so what he's saying is that, you know, like what kind of damage can B have caused to A by attacking? Well, let's say that B burned all of A's crops and A had no harvest for a whole year. Or maybe it was even longer than that. Maybe it was three years or five years. Um, so now A wants to take something as reparation from B. Well, Locke says like even a little piece of land because it keeps creating new harvest after new harvest is gonna be worth more than, than like um, than those few harvests that A lost. I mean, I guess if this land is little enough, maybe that wouldn't really be true. Or if A is big enough. Um, also, uh, it's important that um, Locke excludes money. Um, like, so in other words, if B invaded A and took away all their money. Now, I guess he's thinking, and then it, now it's gone. Maybe B spent it on weapons or something. I don't know. <laughs> but because I guess if B still has all of A's money sitting in a chest here, then I assume that he can just take it back, right? But if B took A's money, so like, um, obviously you can buy land for money. So, Money can be worth as much as land. Um, so, uh, but he, he says, and I don't really understand this argument very well. As to money and such riches and treasure taken away, these are none of nature's goods, 
They have but a fantastical imaginary value. Nature has put no such upon them. They are of no more account by her standard than the wampum take of the Americans to an European prince or the silver money of Europe would have been formerly to an American. Why is that relevant? I mean, if this war is between Europeans and they agree on their value of money, why is that relevant? I understand why it could be relevant if we're talking about, you know, a war between Europeans and Americans. I mean, I mean Americans always means indigenous Americans, right? That's the Americans he's, he's been writing about, <laughs> right? So a war between Europeans and Americans. I can understand why this might be relevant, although it's still not clear that it's relevant. I mean, if something is valuable to me and you and you take it away, don't you owe me damages, even if it's not valuable to you? You might think. But um, um, and uh, you know, he also doesn't talk about destruction of capital goods like industry. Well, so I guess there wasn't that much in the 17th century. Um, but I, so again, he's like not paying attention to that loophole that's created by the means of production. Um, but in any case, uh, I mean, he's trying to do something useful here, whether his argument works or not. So. So anyway, like the point of this argument is supposed to be that however much reparation B might owe A, it's never going to amount to territory. It's always going to be payable and movable. Yeah. Maybe that's like the, the distinction he's trying to draw between money and land is that like because like territory is like needed to be preserved in state of nature for the people who are now in a state of nature after the war. That like because money isn't like a part of a state of nature in the first place, that like they can be taken insofar as they have property to like, generate wealth. Well, okay. So when I say the people here are in a state of nature now, I don't mean that they. Again, there's these two things that state of nature can mean, and it's and and I think like it's not just our confusion. Our authors themselves seem to slip back and forth between them without paying sufficient attention. Like, so one thing state in nature can mean is like the original state of mankind in the primeval forest or whatever. Um, so these people are not back in that, right? I mean, uh, when I say Locke assumes that A has completely destroyed B, I don't mean that he's, he, he thinks that A has, as we say, bombed B back into the Stone Age, right? He, I just mean that he thinks that A has completely disrupted the um, um, political organization, right? So the former government, government of B is not able to make and enforce laws or whatever. So these people still have houses and, you know, like roads and iron and whatever, right? They're not literally in a state of nature and presumably they're not really in the state of nature in that sense. They're in the state of nature in the sense that they don't have a government. But isn't the government like what regulates money in a sense? Well, no, remember, Locke says that money can be introduced in a state of nature. Oh. Yeah. So these people still have plenty of use for money. Um, so yeah, it's hard to understand. Um, um, but anyway, so I don't know how to fix up that argument, but the conclusion of the argument is that A doesn't gain any territory. Um, uh, not even for purposes of reparation. Uh, professor. Um, professor. I mean, um, so the result is that, you know, after having 
like repel the attack on them and if they want making the combatants into slaves um i mean so like it was not the per it was not the practice of european countries fighting each other to make combatants into slaves it was a you know practice on the contrary to allow them to be ransomed you know whatever prisoner retained all that stuff but uh but so I guess this is kind of theoretical. Uh, but anyway, A has the option of making all the combatants into slaves, but that's basically as far as it goes. Then they have to leave. Um, like, but then in real life, so doesn't someone have to help these people like or reorganize themselves? Are they just supposed to? But uh, yeah, Locke doesn't consider that. So the, yeah, these people are now just left alone and um, it's up to them to be like, hey, let's form another colony. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, Locke has a further argument. So this, like I said, this, so so this is already removed. This this means that uh, um, war for the purpose of gain, gaining territory can't possibly a, a just war for the purpose of gaining territory is impossible. It's always unjust. Um, Locke actually has a further argument. This actually comes first in the text. And like I said, this is Locke's way with arguments. It's like, and even if you don't buy this argument, there's another argument, right? So even though it comes first in the text, he has a further argument where he says, okay, let me concede even though it's not true that um, that A retains all the territory it needs without the consent of, without the free consent of the former citizens of B. I mean, of course, if they freely consent to it, they could become part of A, but obviously that's gonna, it's gonna be hard to get their free consent. Like, <laughs> no way, we just, we just talked about it. Right. So, but anyway, so suppose without that consent, A nevertheless returns, retains all this territory. And not only that, but like the leader of A then, or the government of A then distributes some of B's territory to the people who fought on their side. Right. So this is like settler colonialism. Right. Or like like what William the Conqueror did when he conquered England. So, um, um, so in that case, if we allow them to do all of that, what is there left to argue? Well, Locke says, um, nevertheless, this doesn't make the conqueror into an absolute ruler, right? So now he's arguing against the idea. He's, he's saying, like, even if you allow conquest, it can't be a basis for saying that um, a certain ruler is an absolute ruler. And here he's arguing against, I don't think it's Filmer. Again, I'm not sure who he's arguing against, but he's arguing against people who say that because the right, the title of the king of England is by conquest, the king of England is absolute, <laughs> right? Because it's by conquest of William the Conqueror. So Locke says, well, like, hold on a second. You know, so now, so this is the situation at this point. So in the meanwhile, someone else has conquered A, <laughs> right? Like France has conquered A, <laughs> and the ruler of A is now only ruler over the former B. <laughs> And they're, but they're saying, since I'm ruler here by conquest, I have absolute power. So Locke says, 
Well, hold on a second. First of all, conquering D can't give them any absolute power over the other people who fought with them. They didn't defeat them. So like all these people who have moved in are not, uh, A has no absolute power over them. Um, and then he says, moreover, the new and old populations are eventually probably going to merge in this situation. Right? So, like, he imagines that, you know, the king of England coming to him and saying, hey, Locke, I have absolute power over you because my title is by contrast. And Locke says, well, I'm going to claim to be descended from Normans. And how, how can they prove otherwise? Right? So, because the conquerors and the conquered are all mixed together now, and the law doesn't make any distinction between them. So, um, right, he says, it, it seldom happens that the conquerors and the conquered never incorporate into one people. So in the long run, um, even, if this, even if this unjust conquest, and right, even if the original war was just, the conquest is unjust, this is what he's just proved. Even if this unjust conquest is allowed to stand and nothing ever disrupts it, eventually we're going to return probably to the situation where we have one commonwealth and a ruler and all the things that he says about commonwealths, the rest of the book are going to apply. Basically. So, you know, this ruler has to rule by consent to the citizens, etc. Um, Okay, so that's what I want to say about conquest proper. Then I'm going to go to talk on about the right of resistance and rebellion. And so the right of resistance and rebellion occurs both after a conquest and after other events that happen inside one commonwealth. So are there questions about this stuff before I go on to that? Oh. Um, oh, sorry. I, it's not that I have you on mute. It's that I had my volume turned down. You cannot see the drawing. Which drawing couldn't you see? Uh, oh, the one way I see. It's way over there for me. That was probably a long time ago. No, maybe not. Maybe it was just this, just this one. I'm not sure. How, I should watch these videos. I'm not sure how well these drawings on the board show up at all. <laughs> on the other hand, I found like I have listened to the audio from from previous lectures, and I found that I'm able to understand it, even though I obviously don't see the picture here. On the other hand, I guess I know what picture I was drawing. This was the picture that A conquered B, moved their population into B. Now the ruler of A claims absolute power over everyone in the former territory of B. But Locke says, meanwhile, the new and old populations have combined. That's right. That argument is not there. All right. Um, okay, so right of yeah, so I'm sorry, I had the, I didn't realize I had the volume turned down. Um, I should be able to hear you now if you, if you say something. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so rights of resistance and rebellion. These are, so these are not exactly the same thing, which is important. Like, um, you know, there's a right of uh, just not going along with specific acts of the government, resisting them. And then there's a, a, a different right of like overturning the government and trying to replace it. But they kind of, I mean, they obviously are similar considerations in both cases. Um,
So first of all, um, um, these rights, according to the story that Locke just told about conquest, are obviously going to belong to the people in the conquered territory. If right, that is, if the victor, whether in a just or an unjust war, decides to hold on to the territory, the people living there have a right to resist from rebel against them. Um, and Locke says they always do. Now, obviously, the argument we made before about the new and old populations combining is eventually going to undermine that as well, right? Like if the, you know, if the English now decided they want to throw off the Norman yoke, how would they do it? <laughs> right? Like there's, you know, uh, there's there's no one left to rebel against. But but in principle, is if the populations don't mix, Locke is saying. Um, they always have this right. This is in chapter seven, sixteen, section one seventy six, um, page ninety two. Um, the conquered or their children. Have no courts, no arbitrary on earth, no arbitrator on earth to appeal to. Yeah. Then they may appeal as Jephthah did to heaven and repeat their appeal till they have recovered the native right of their ancestors, which was to have such a legislative over them as the majority should approve and freely acquiesce in. Right, so I think I mentioned before what this this phrase appeal to heaven, what it means. He's, he's alluding to the story about Jephthah in the book of Judges. How do you say that in English? Jephthah? I don't know. Anyway, that, uh, you know, he says, uh, like, to the king of the Ammonites, I think it is in that story, he's like, let God be the judge between me and you. Meaning, like now we're gonna fight and see who wins. <laughs> right? So that's what Locke always means when he talks about appeal to heaven. I mean, it's not clear whether in his mind this involves some belief that God will make the right side win. It doesn't seem that way, way from what he says in the essay. Right, where he talks about the afterlife. He doesn't talk about God like giving out rewards and punishments right here and now. Um, I don't know. Anyway, it's it, it seems like it's more than a figure of speech, though. It's like I guess it means like I'm using, I'm appealing to the means that that God left me to defend myself in this situation, namely my own force. I think that's what it means. So anyway, so they and they they may repeat their appeal, right? Meaning they can try to rebel over and over again until they succeed. Um, so uh, Locke brings up an immediate objection: if it be objected, if it be objected, this would ca cause endless trouble. I mean, so his answer to the objection is, I answer no more than justice does where she lies open to all that appeal to her. Um, but by which he means, he goes on to explain in the next sentence, he that troubles his neighbor without a cause is punished for it by the justice of the court he appeals to. And he that appeals to heaven must be sure he has right on his side, and a right too that is worth the trouble and cost of the appeal, as he will answer at a tribunal that cannot be deceived. So, um, right, what he's saying is, well, this, no, this won't cause endless trouble because, um, Number one, people are not going to just like um, 
claim out of nowhere that they've been conquered and start rebelling. Um, uh, and uh, they aren't going to do it over small things either. Like, I guess if we went back to that situation where they took only a little bit of our territory, you know, but for the people who live here, that might be a big deal. I'm not sure. Anyway, the point is, he's saying, like, people are going to weigh the costs and benefits. This, this, this form of appeal is costly. <laughs> it's risky, right? People aren't going to do it lightly. This is not going to lead to endless trouble. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it kind of seems like this has been the cause of endless trouble. <laughs> this doctrine. Um, uh, although, and, you know, perhaps more trouble than the previous system. I mean, it's, it's hard to say, like, like when the Austro-Hungarian Empire conquered, like, big parts of Europe, like, in the old system, people were like, okay, I guess now we're part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So like that war was unjust, I guess, you know, but the damage was limited. Then when people started saying, hey, we have a right to our ancestral lands, then it started a ton of wars that are still going on. <laughs> That's, you know, um, so it's not 100% clear that it isn't, that it, this isn't the cause of extra trouble. Um, and also, like this simple doctrine kind of fails to take into account the complicated way things that actually happen, right? Like, you know, so suppose B attacks A. Well, no, I didn't even have to say that. Suppose A attacks B. So this is an unjust war. A conquers B. So this is like should be B, but it's now part of A. And now let's say people from C move in peacefully, right? Like they follow the laws of A. Now let's say the B people want to rebel. Are the C people combatants or non-combatants? <laughs> there could be a lot of them. Right, there could be more of them than the B people. <laughs> so, I mean, and I think that's a relatively simple case. You know, I, like in the real world, things are much more complicated than that have happened. So, um, so like, yeah, it's not clear like how well this. I mean, like, for example, suppose B is Manhattan. So, and A is. <laughs> and you know, A comes in and conquers B. And well, of course, it's not Holland anymore, but let's just forget about exactly how it got transferred from Holland to, to England to the US. <laughs> Assume it was still A, you know, now there's like millions and millions of people living here. They moved in peacefully, they bought property, they, you know. They have title, whatever, but their title actually, like, I think this is the case. I never looked into this really. This is what I've heard that, you know, like when you buy a new house, they do a title check and everything. That they, like, in the case of my house, I guess the, the chain of title goes back to a grant from the King of Spain. And the King of Spain's title was by conquest. <laughs> so my title to my house is by conquest. Well, anyway, so that's true of all these people in Manhattan, right? Now, like the original inhabitants, if there's any of them left, if they want to rebel, do they have a right to kill everyone? <laughs> but if not, what can they do? So, you know, so this doctrine is like not perfectly worked out as something that can be done in practice, I guess I would say, but the principle of it is, is pretty important and Locke is very like, um, uh, strict about it. <laughs> There's a perpetual right to rebellion against the unjust conflict. Um, This, no, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm long time, and I haven't even talked about the right to rebellion. All right. So, any case, so Locke explicitly connects 
whatever, however traffic English is in international affairs, it's important because Locke explicitly connects that perpetual right of rebellion against conquerors to the broader rights of resistance and rebellion against usurped or tyrannical governments. Right, so now let's suppose we just have A. And this is the legislative, the legitimate legislative of A. And here comes you and wipes it out and takes over the usurper. Right, so that's a usurped government. So um, at the beginning of chapter 17, Locke says, um, as conquest may be called a foreign usurpation, so usurpation is a kind of domestic con conquest. With this difference that an usurper can never have right on his side, it being no usurp usurpation, but where one has got into the possession of what another has right to. So, so Locke says, in this situation, we have the legislative that um, the people originally consented to. How do we know they originally consented to? Um, well, I mean, because Locke admits that the origins of commonwealths are usually lost in the mists of history. And he says, God, it's, it's only by luck sometimes we know something about it. But I guess the point is, like, there was tacit consent. People were living by its laws. Um, um, that, I mean, even that answer still raises some questions here. Is that enough? Like maybe every commonwealth whose origin lies in the midst of history should right away convene a constitutional convention <laughs> and replace it with a uh, commonwealth that has explicit um, consent. Um, you might even say, well, actually, I mean, so. Maybe I'll leave this when I talk about Rousseau, because Rousseau, in effect, does say this. He might even say that he constantly needs a renewal of assent, of consent, right? Like what we say about sexual relations. Um, how is this any less severe than that? Uh, but in any case, so but Locke, I think, takes it that if people are living peacefully on a, under a government, it's a sign that they consent to it. Um, and so this is the legislative that the, that the people consent to. And along comes, comes someone else and like takes its place, whether they change the form of government or not. So like this could be a monarchy and the usurper doesn't change anything except says, and now I'm king. Um, uh, they're still a usurper, but they're not the legislator. The people didn't put the legislator in them, they put it in someone else. So Locke says, this is just like conquest. Um, So one result of this is um, that if we find ourselves under some, and I think this may help with some of the complications of the view on conquest, if we find ourselves under some government that's either illegitimately obtained, so it's usurped, or extended, extended powers beyond what could be legitimate. So this is, another case. So now suppose it's the original legislative or it could be someone else, it doesn't matter now. They start to exercise powers beyond what is allowed through a legitimate legislature. Like they start to rule by decree, for example, rather than by laws. Um, so that's what law calls tyranny. Um, so if we find ourselves under a government that does it's doing either of those things, we don't have to prove that we've been conquered. It doesn't matter whether they're domestic or foreign. 
it's an unjust government. We have the right to rebel against it. Um, Yeah, let me skip down here and talk about. So, so again, um, so Locke says basically, whenever that happens, um, uh, there is no more. There is no more power. It's the the usurper or the tyrant has put themselves into the state of nature. It's next to the people, and they have the right to defend them. Um, and they right have a right to defend themselves uh, even before it happens. If they see things go in that direction. He's thinking, of course, about the run up to the glorious revolution, right? He's thinking about people's suspicion that um, King James was planning to return England to Catholicism, which is um, falls under one of is um, uh, falls outside the legitimate power of the legislative because it equals giving the like delivering the people up to a foreign power, namely the Pope. Right? That's that's the analysis that's going on in the background here. Why he's like why a lot of this stuff is coming up, right? So it's like, of course, James hasn't actually done that yet. But we see everything he's doing is going in the direction of trying to get absolute power for himself and trying to reinstitute Catholicism. Um, so we have a right to get rid of him before it's too late. Um, but again, he faces the objection. So like, hold on a second. I mean, are you saying that every time I feel like the government is being is unjust or that the, you know, so uh, let's say we have a system where the executive is elected every four years and we have an election and someone says they won the election and they move in and now they're the executive. And I say they didn't really win, it was stolen. So they are a usurper. So Locke is saying anyone who feels that way should rebel. Every time, again, it seems like a recipe for endless trouble. Um, so he says, um, this is section 208 in chapter 18. Um, um, It being as impossible for one or a few oppressed men to disturb the government, where the body of the people do not think of them, themselves concerned in it, as for a raving madman or a heady malcontent to overturn a well-settled state, the people being as little apt to follow the one as the other. Right, so what he's saying is, yeah, in theory, anytime the government does injustice against me or any time I don't detect any irregularity in the procedure by which the legislature was chosen or whatever, I have a right to rise up in rebellion. But he says, you know, like, even suppose I don't have that right. I could still just choose to rise up in rebellion. Why doesn't that happen all the time? Well, because most people don't want the trouble, right? So like if someone starts saying, hey, help me rebel against the government, everyone else is gonna be like, no, no, thank, no, thank you. You know, you take care of that, right? So like he's saying, you know, it, uh, it doesn't make it worse to say that sometimes it's just, it's still gonna be the same calculation. People aren't gonna join in unless it's really, really serious and it's affecting them. 
um, which is reassuring to his opponents who worry about rebellion and civil war, right? Of course, it's not that reassuring to people who are wor mostly worried about oppression <laughs> because the moral is that, yeah, it's pretty hard to rebel against people, you know, it's not gonna be easy to get that to happen. Um, but what I wonder about this, and I guess this is the last thing I have time to say is that this is kind of similar to what I was saying before about uh, commonwealths being in the state of nature. What does it mean to say that the law of nature binds the government? given what he's just said. So it has to mean there's some kind of like artificial chain on the government. That is the, I mean, not the, okay, so the, the, the legitimate government, the legislative, insofar as it actually acts as, a, acts as the legislative, just has no will other than the law. It has no will other than the good of the people. But of course, it's composed of actual individuals, right? And the question is, like, um, what's keeping them from behaving unjustly and taking the power that's been entrusted to them and using it unjustly? Yeah. Isn't it the fear of rebellion? Right. So it's the fear of rebellion. But you just said that rebellion is pretty unlikely unless you really go overboard. Right? Like you can do a lot of things against private people or against whole groups of people. That's like the scarier part, maybe, which he doesn't really mention. That, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be just private person X, Y, and Z. It can be a whole group of people. And as long as everyone else feels like it's not going to affect them. <laughs> so it means that, like, this, this tie doesn't seem very strong. It, um, unless he's thinking, as in the essay, that, that they should be worried about punishment in the aftermath, it's not clear exactly how the law of nature is going to work there. All right, um, that's all I have time for. Let's see you next time we'll talk about Rousseau.